When I realized that Python 3.12 is just around the corner, I got pretty excited. Nice! The thing that I was most excited about is that we're just two versions away from Python 3.14, also called Python. There are definitely some new things coming to be excited about, but next to that you should also be aware of a couple of things that are going to be removed. Now, before we dive into Python 3.12, I have something for you. It's a free guide to help you learn how to design a piece of software from scratch. You can get this at iron.codes slash design guide. It contains the seven steps that I take whenever I design a new piece of software, and hopefully it helps you avoid some of the mistakes that I made in the past. Arion.codes slash design guide. The link is also in the description of this video. Now, let's dive into Python 3.12. The first thing that's improved in Python 3.12 is the error messages. Now, over the last version updates of Python, already error messages were improved a lot, but there are even more things in this particular release. So, for example, one thing is that modules from the standard library are now suggested as part of the error messages. You can actually see that here. So, if you try to use sys.something, then it's going to mention, hey, did you forget to import sys? It's a minor thing, but it's pretty useful. Another thing is that the error messages are also smarter with common errors that people make. For example, you quite often see somebody typing import x from y instead of from x import y. And the error message is more explicit in recommending to uh, do it the correct way. Another way in which error messages have become smarter is that if you're referring to something that belongs to self, that belongs to an object, but you forget the self dot, then also the name error message actually refers to that. And finally, if you have an import error and you get some exception, like for example, you try to import something from a module, but that doesn't work, well, then it automatically suggests corrections like these. Now, these are relatively small improvements in error messaging, but Overall, they do make the coding experience in Python a lot better. The second thing that I want to talk about is performance improvements. Now, Python 3.11 was a huge leap forward in performance improvements with respect to Python 3.10, improving speed by up to 60% sometimes. Now, from Python 3.11 to Python 3.12, it's not that big of a difference, but there are a couple of tweaks here and there in the code that do help a lot. One of those improvements is comprehension inlining, and that was suggested by PEP709. Comprehension is a really nice feature of Python that allows you to create a list, a dictionary, or a set using just a few simple rules. Here's an example of what a comprehension looks like. Now, what happened in the past is that these comprehensions were internally represented by functions that uh, each had a separate frame for the context of that particular function. And that meant in terms of performance that comprehensions were not the greatest. So what they've done in Python 3.12 is that they now create these comprehensions inline. And that means you don't need these nested functions anymore. And that leads to a big speed up. In some isolated benchmark, this speeds up the execution of comprehension up to two times. And in the real world code benchmark using comprehensions, there was a overall performance improvement of 11%. Not too shabby. There are a few other things that may also help improve performance. For example, the W string and W string length members have been removed from objects and that reduces the object size. So that just saves memory and potentially avoids cache misses and things like that. Another thing that was added in Python 3.12 is immortal objects. Now in Python, in principle, every object has a reference count to keep track of whether the object is still being used. But of course, that's only relevant if that's an object that the user is actually creating and then doesn't need it anymore in the future. There are some objects that are simply always needed by the system, for example. And this is exactly what an immortable object is. So the reference count is never updates, it always stays the same. Now that might seem like a pretty insignificant minor thing, but it could actually have huge implications for Python in the future. Because now with immortal objects, we can indicate that an object is basically never going to change. And you're going to avoid, again, cache invalidations. You're going to avoid data races where multiple pieces of code want to modify the same data. If it's immortal, we know, okay, that's not going to change. So that makes things much simpler. And this actually helps with the next feature that's also new in Python 3.12, although you can't redo a lot with it at the moment, which is the per interpreter GIL, global interpreter lock. And that's actually a pretty big change in how Python works. So you can now have sub interpreters that each have their own global interpreter lock. And this allows 
Python to take better advantage of multiple CPU cores, which is a huge deal. Now, unfortunately, Python 3.12 doesn't really expose this capability yet. It's merely the C Python internals that allow for this. Here you see a piece of uh, C code that actually does this. Uh, you are gonna have to wait for 3.13 in order to have this behavior. And there's going to be a new module called interpreters that is gonna allow for you to do this from Python itself. Here's an example of what that's probably going to look like in Python 3.13. So you simply create an interpreter and then you run some Python code that you supply as a string. And if you want, you can also run this in a thread. Now, I'm sure this is probably gonna change before they release this in Python 3.13, but at least it gives you an idea of what's coming. Another thing that's really nice in Python 3.12 is that F strings are going to become less finicky. Like you can now have nested double quotes, which is really cool. So this is what that looks like. And again, that may seem like a minor difference in the way that you write your Python code, but actually because this wasn't possible in earlier versions, you always had to resort to different types of quotes. And that means there was a limit to how far these nested strings with variables with other strings can go. Now, practically speaking, I don't think you should have deeply nested strings like this in your code anyway, but it's good that this at least is something that now we have to worry less about. We don't have to think about, hey, uh, we need to switch to different types of quotes because this is simply not going to work. So minor fix, but it's nice that it's there. Then there are a couple of changes that are more related with types and type annotations. One thing is that if you have keyword arguments that you can use the unpack mechanism and provide it with a type to define the type of keyword arguments. In earlier versions of Python, it didn't work like this. So if you wanted to specify a type for your keyword arguments, you had to do something like this, for example. And now this means that each keyword argument is going to be a string. There was no easy way to define that uh, keyword arguments would, for example, be a name and a year. And now you can do that using unpack and then you simply supply the type that defines the type of the keyword arguments. By the way, I'm not really a big fan of keyword arguments. I try to be just as explicit as possible with the arguments that I provide to my function. So I'm just wondering, are you using keyword arguments like this a lot? What are you using them for? Any tips, recommendations? Let me know in the comments. Another thing that's also coming in Python 3.12 is the override keyword. And what this helps you do is indicate explicitly that one method overrides another method. Let's say you have this base class with a get color method and we have a child that overrides get color and returns something else. But we also have a bad child that also overrides it but misspells the name. And now what Python 3.12 will add, unfortunately this doesn't work yet as I'm running this at the moment, but this is supposed to give a type error because now of course you're overriding the method wrongly because you're mistyping it. And it's nice that the type checker now gives an error for this because running this code means that we would expect to get red, but actually this prints blue because it calls the original method instead of this overridden wrong method. But in my opinion, these two things are not the biggest changes with respect to types and type annotations. The biggest one is a new syntax for type parameters or generic classes and functions. This has been proposed in PEP 695. And what's nice about this is that this is gonna really simplify the way you deal with generics. Now, before we had to do some complicated stuff in Python with using type vars, you can actually see that here, and then we could use a class and actually uh, define it like this. But with the new syntax, we don't need any of those things anymore. We can simply specify that, hey, we have a class that is a generic class that relies on a type T that uh, inherits from a string. And then we have a method that then returns something of that type T. So instead of doing this, saying that the type is covariant and it's bound to the string type, we don't need any of that anymore. It's way, way simpler. And I like that a lot. Same for functions. So up until now, this is how we define a generic function. So we have a type T using type var, and then we have a B in this case, and it also returns something of type T. The new syntax doesn't need type vars anymore. It simply specifies T like this, which is much close to how other programming languages are doing that as well. Another example is if you define a type alias. So this is how you would do that up until now using a type var, but now you can simply specify it as part of the alias itself. And there's also a new syntax for specifying type aliases that looks like this. So really nice improvements 
to the way that you deal with types in Python. It's just one of the many steps forward. I'm still waiting for an improved callable syntax. I would love to have the arrow syntax style in Python like we have in languages such as TypeScript. By the way, if you enjoy these types of videos, you might also like my free weekly newsletter where I cover Python news and all kinds of other interesting things that I run across. You can subscribe by going to ioncodes.com. A few other minor changes in Python 3.12 that I think are noteworthy. First, pathlib now has a walk method that allows you to walk the directory trees and generate files and directory names similar to what we had with os.walk. So it's nice that this is now part of pathlib because I use this a lot if I want to explore a tree of directories. Another minor thing is that C Python 3.12 supports the ability to monitor calls, returns, lines, exceptions, and all other types of events using instrumentation. That means that uh, it's going to be way faster if you need very fast debugging or coverage tools because they just can access exactly what they need. And finally, a few things that you need to know. Uh, there are a couple of modules that have been removed in Python 3.12, such as AsyncAt and Async Core, which have been superseded by Async IO, which is the all encompassing package for asynchronous concurrent operations. Also, this utils has been removed because it was already deprecated in Python 3.10 and now typically you will use setup tools instead. Also good to know that a lot of old stuff has been removed from the unit test package, such as these uh, deprecated aliases for these method names that you should use instead from now on. So I hope this gives you an idea of what to expect with Python 3.12. I'm very excited about it. Can't wait for it to be released so I can actually start uh, using the stable version. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this. In particular, I'm quite happy about the improvements in type annotations. Now, if you want to learn more about how these type annotations actually work and why you should definitely use them in your Python code, watch this video next. Thanks for watching and take care.